More than two billion people have it, yet much of the world is ashamed to talk about it. I'm Femi O.K. And I'm Malika Bilal. Today we tackle the mystery of menstruation. That might be just a little bit awkward, but it's basic science and essential knowledge you won't want to miss. Plus, it's also very trendy online at the moment, so don't go away. I just discovered something great. It's Rely, a new tampon from Procter & Gamble. It's now. It's neat. And so discreet. Life looks great with Tampax Pearl. Its built-in backup braid helps stop leaks by channeling them back into the core. Ads for period products have evolved over the years, but how much has our understanding and treatment of menstruation evolved? I'll let our community speak for itself. I used to attend a church where if you were menstruating, you couldn't attend church till after eight days. And even before you could attend church, you had to have a cleansing bath. She was not allowed the general pathway inside the house, but she had to exit from the front door and re-enter from the back door in order to use the washroom. They should not touch the other, uh, other person's belongings and they should, after their uh, monthly cycles are over, they should clean their surroundings. Girls often try to postpone their menstruation uh, using herbs and hormone tablets to uh, avoid this ritual. And uh, they occur some uh, gynecological problems in their later Myths and misperceptions like these are often presented as fact, and religious and cultural beliefs can make menstruation taboo and a source of shame. If a girl doesn't have access to a private bathroom or hygienic products, going to school, let alone work, is often out of the question. And despite or because of the taboo, menstruation is making waves online. Activists are using art and social media movements to assert that hashtag menstruation matters to everyone. A popular Indian actor is even on board making a movie about the real-life menstruation man who pioneered low-cost pads in India. So obviously, we have to talk about it. From London, Palaumi Basu is a storyteller, activist and photographer who spent three years documenting the banishment of menstruating women and girls in Western Nepal. In Nairobi, Sabrina Ribli is the CEO of Femme International, which is working to prevent menstruating girls from missing or dropping out of school in Kenya and Tanzania. In Brooklyn, New York, Pablo Freund is the co-founder and chief operating officer of Be Girl, which makes reusable menstrual products. And right here in our studio, we have Dr. Amma Madku. He is an obstetrician gynecologist and assistant professor at George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Sciences. Welcome, experts. We are going to give you a workout. Malika Bilal, you start first. Okay, uh, so we put out a call to our community asking for myths, misconceptions that they might have heard. We got back a lot. This is just one. This is Shade. Uh, that's the handle. King of Good Men is, 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 is this person's profile. Th that it's the womb weeping over not being made full use of. That's what a period is. But before we laugh too much, Shade goes on to tell us where they got this from. A psychology lecturer, physiology, excuse me, lecturer. He said that nature does not waste anything unnecessarily except if not used. So that's why weeping womb. Doctor, have you heard that? And what do you say to that? I mean, this is a lecturer, yeah. a professor. No, that's a first for me, but it's, it's quite poetic. Um, I mean, it, there, is a, there is a truth to that. Um, what the uterus is doing as a woman is moving through her menstrual cycle um, is she's preparing her body for a pregnancy. And um, the, the lining of the uterus, which is uh, the inside of the uterus, goes through a, a, a very dramatic change. And if it isn't going, to, uh, and if a, a pregnancy doesn't result, um, at the end of the cycle, it needs to reset. It needs to, sh you know, we shed the lining and um, and then get ready for the next opportunity. Morgan so. O'Reilly shared another idea with us. I'm going to share this with you, guess. Their periods attract bears. There being women's periods attract bears. They can smell the menstruation. Um, when you hear that, Sabrina, what's your first thought? Um, smart bears. I mean, I mean, if you're living in the wilderness and there is blood, I mean, maybe the bears can scent something. But I think stories like that, that women and young girls um, hear, it makes girls feel scared and it reinforces that um, menstruation can be scary and, and apparently even dangerous, um, putting them at risk of bear attacks. So um, it, it, it's not so scary, in fact. <laughs> 
Okay, so here's another one. This is from the LZ, and this one made me angry. Uh, this is one common myth that they can, they being women, can control when they get it so that they can use it as an excuse to do less work. And this was from a friend's male boss, so someone really believes this. Palumi, how would you knock this one down? Oh my God, I think it's outrageous. And uh, this is not the first time I've heard it. I've even heard it. Uh, when I was reporting in Nepal where women were sent into exile and lots of people said that, oh, it's the time where women get to rest, you know, or they make it in, as an excuse to sort of go and rest. And I think that's an absolute, it's complete nonsense because, you know, it's an, I, I think, in, I mean, from the culture I come from, in endometriosis, any, any form of sort of menstrual pain is not even considered a problem you know it's not even like nobody thinks it's important for you so if you actually feel the pain or you think you're feeling weak and you're not capable of coming to work people just think you're making things up they think women use everything they have as an excuse to like you know something that I encounter very commonly in my medical practice is women who are there because they are being kept from uh, being able to work if they are having a, a troublesome period and, and um, many of them are very frustrated and um, and are looking for ways to be able to cut back on if they if they have a troublesome period being uh, having to miss time from work or school. So, uh, thankfully, that's not something the average woman is going to have to contend with. But for the, there's absolutely no um, you know no truth behind women being able to control their periods to do that. And it's quite the opposite. I think that most women, if they are being held back because of a problem with their period, they're trying very hard to to try to, to correct that. I just want to take a pause for a moment because if you're wondering about what a period is, what is menstruation, I want to give you some solid facts. Have a listen to this. Day one of the menstrual cycle is the first day of a period. The uterus starts to shed its lining. As soon as the period ends, the uterus prepares again to receive a fertilized egg. Eggs are released from a woman's ovaries. Eggs are super tiny one-tenth the size of a poppy seed. Women have two ovaries, one on each side. The fallopian tubes lead from each ovary to the uterus. In the middle of the menstrual cycle, an ovary releases an egg. After ovulation, the egg travels down the fallopian tube. It takes a few days to complete the journey. Meanwhile, the lining of the uterus gradually gets thicker so it can support the development of a fertilized egg. If the egg gets fertilized, it will implant in the uterus and the woman is pregnant. If the egg is not fertilized, the woman is not pregnant and the egg will begin to dissolve. Because the woman is not pregnant, the lining of the uterus is not needed. A woman will have her monthly period and the cycle begins again. Pallavi, you did a lot of activism, you took a lot of photographs and you went to Nepal as well to document what was happening to women there. Can you tell us about why you did it and what you found behind your camera? Well, I was really interested in uh, exposing, you know, um, normalized violence against women. I was interested in documenting how a lot of war for women begins at home and how, because I grew up in a very patriarchal, ritualistic Hindu house, you know, I could see that, you know, all these traditions and rituals were used to dominate women, were used to being controlled women. So I started researching and finding, you know, what are the, what are the basic structures that go into, uh, you know, creating extreme forms of violence against women. Like one thing we see a lot is the repeated narrative of rape and, you know, sexual assault, which comes a lot from my part of the world. But I wasn't seeing enough uh, work on the more like the structures, you know, and the beliefs that people have and the attitudes they have towards certain, you know, something like menstruation that go on to creating those extreme forms of gendered violence. So I chanced upon Chopadi because menstruation is obviously something not talked about. It's not taken seriously enough. And so I found this vicious circle around blood that blood creates, you know, so I found during this extreme practice during which women are banished and sent into, you know, exiles, not only during as soon as they hit puberty, but also at childbirth. That's Tula, a 15 year old girl, and she's exiled during menstruation during her exams were going on that time. And she was sharing the shed with a uh, cow uh, and the farm animals. She's the sole bread earning member of her family. And she's thinking of dropping out of school. Her legs are completely damaged and infected by insect bites. And she hasn't had 
proper um, you know um, healthcare in a long time so i could see the strain like the debilitating impacts the ritual was having and nobody was doing anything about it like i i partnered with uh, water aid uh, water aid uh, sent me back to nepal to sort of uh, document some more work and we partnered with them to raise uh, money to sort of on in this campaign called to be a girl campaign which uh, my work from nepal India and also another photographer worked in Uganda and other places and we raised money to provide sanitary kits and uh, you know pads to the girls but then again I, I really love the idea of the sev the reusable menstru menstrual pads you mm -hmm. know because one of the big problem in these societies are disposal you know how do you dispose these products if you're going to use a sanitary pad who's going to dispose it how will this be disposed and that's a problem and so I, I figured that the crux of the problem is that in Hinduism the concept of pure and impurity is so high that you know even having a toilet inside your home is a problem because it's something that is dirty so might as well not have toilets you know or have them outside so mm -hmm. which automatically pushes women to go outside they don't have the dignity then once women go outside they get raped they get molested they get harassed you know so i wanted Palume. to really start a massive dialogue around this issue Palumi, I was thinking about Chapari as well, and kind of the ironic double standard that emerges. Uh, girls are being secluded to a hut or, or exiled um, because they are somehow impure. Um, but then, you know, you hear about this uh, consistent violence happening to girls as they are in the huts. Uh, there's rape and yeah. other forms of violence. Absolutely. And so it, doesn't make any sense really from the logic standpoint. And, and this is where we have to step back and look at the taboos and the enforcement of these rights. Um, many times if you were to talk, talk to a girl and ask her why is she outside the home in this exile, uh, you would find that they would self-exile because the belief system reinforces an understanding that they are doing something that is good for their family. They are removing an impurity from the household. So the first step is also to empower women and girls with good medical knowledge, with good oh, objective absolutely. knowledge. Um, yeah, I completely agree. And one of the things I obviously saw was that, you know, I grouped up boys and girls in different groups. And I wanted to hear what the little boys think about this and then what the girls think about this. And what I figured that all the boys were saying they don't want like their mothers and their little sisters going out and having to live outside. They don't understand what menstruation is, but they believe that the gods in the house will get angry and they will be bring some form of calamity, but they don't like it. And the women, the girls kept saying that oh, we do it because our mother told us to do this, our grandmother told us to do it. So you see how this form, this is the price of a patriarchal system, right? It's sort of like, it's intergenerational violence. You sort of, you know, women pass this to women. You know, I'm glad that, Palumi, that you mentioned boys in Nepal being concerned about this as well. One person says, I don't understand why men demonize menstruation. I used to buy sanitary pads for my cousin all the time before she got married, as though it was the norm. We also got a video comment from someone who says something similar about what it was like to learn about this process in a class of all boys. This is Rafe. Uh, we were taught as per the course requirement, which was enough to make sense of what it was and what happened. However, we did not recognize the taboo associated with it in the society. Uh, I must point out that it was an all-male classroom and there was an air of awkwardness about it. Uh, as we progressed into more classes about this topic, uh, the topic was demystified and it was like any other science topic. So, Doctor, you heard how it was demystified for him in a classroom setting. Uh, for you, our producer told us ahead of the show that there was a book that was kind of integral to your learning about it. I actually pulled out that book here. The one that a lot of us online and around the world have read. This is by Judy Bloom. Are You There, God? It's me, Margaret. Right. Talk, to us, talk to us about that. That was my introduction to uh, menstruation. And my, uh, my sister brought it home from school. And her and I were very, very, uh, are very, very close, and um, and I, I read it shortly. I think I might have even te uh, taken it from her and then read it first. But uh, um, I think it 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 goes back to exactly what our other guests are saying, um, where education is 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 integral to changing the narrative, and I think allowing also for a, a, a change in how. Um, we understand like uh, the ways that women are excluded from like certain ritual responsibilities or social responsibilities, and making it. And, and, and I've often wondered like if that's if there's a way to turn that into um, how we can create a safe space for women, because for many women who are 
are menstruating and have um, troublesome periods, abnormal uterine bleeding, um, it may actually be difficult for them to keep up with certain rigors of what they may have to do and be, by being able to create a safe space for them and having that be part of like the co everyday education of, of boys and girls where they can understand that sometimes uh, women need to be provided that, that safe space, but for the most part, this is a normal process. You mentioned everyday conversation. I, I mean, so we got this tweet. I, I'm, I want to pose it to you all. Um, this is a tweet we got from someone, and I think they're disappointed. Uh, Wisdom says, now my 10-year-old daughter is asking me what it is. Just how do I explain this to her? So I want your answers, but there is, is someone online. Is that she was watching the stream? This, the stream, yes. And Did I she think, not watch the bit at the beginning? I think this person's disappointed <laughs> that their 10-year-old now knows about this. Oh. This is an answer, though, they got from one person. And this is Megan who says, you can tell your daughter that her body is healthy and menstruation shows she's entering the prime of her life. Sabrina, Good what, what would you tell her? I, I would echo Megan. I think that um, for a young girl, it can be a, a pretty strange thing to suddenly get your period and be considered a woman when you're only 10 or 11 or 12 years old. Uh, but if we teach girls that it's something normal and natural and something to be proud of and, and it's not something that you need to feel embarrassed about, it doesn't change. You're still the same person as you were um, the day before. But I think that's why creating these safe spaces for girls to learn about their periods is so important because oftentimes girls don't get that education, education that they need. So they're learning about their period from all sorts of different places and then having these myths taught to them as facts. And I think that can be incredibly destructive. Um, so girls need to be taught that it's normal. It's something that every single woman in the world experiences pretty much. Um, and it should unite women instead of making us feel um, uncomfortable and, and ashamed of ourselves. I think young girls around the world have enough issues to deal with that getting her period shouldn't be something else that, that oppresses her and makes her feel um, anything less than confident and proud to be who she is. There's a yeah, I mean, I totally, I completely agree. I mean, I think that it's important to tell girls that they get beautiful, magical power, you know, when they get period and that how we as women, we create the habitat, you know, and the nature and our environment tunes to the natural rhythms of our body. And it's really important that young girls know that, you know, that we become, we, we come up with these magical powers, you know, one day when we hit puberty and that makes us very powerful as women, you know, not someone, not a weak so not something weak to be looked down upon or like shamed, you know? In fact, it's quite yeah. the opposite. And I think that's exactly part of the conversation is changing the nature. Like Megan said, it, it's about reframing it in, in a positive light. It's about breaking these views that have persisted so long that there's incorrect uh, facts being put out there as truths. And in, in parallel to those facts incorrect as uh, that are incorrect, there's the whole supporting environment of the cultural and traditional views uh, that make it very, very difficult for objective knowledge to break through. And so what we have to create is good environments and we can uh, educate girls and women with better information and also empower them uh, to go against some of these views that are actually put in place as barriers to their own Hello. development and empowerment. I'm so glad you said that because I was just hovering over an ad that's been going around India for a couple of years and it's about the taboo of when you are menstruating, whatever you do, do not touch the pickle. Now that I've given you that information, check out the ad. <gasps> she touched the pickle. She touched the pickle. Oh, yes, she did. Haan, Baba, she touched the pickle. Oh, yay! Yeah, she touched the pickle! I touched the pickle! Periods ke dino mein kehte hai, don't wear whites, don't go out, don't play, don't touch the pickle. I say girls, let's break the taboos. Go ahead and touch the pickle. Whisper kadam badai ja. All right. Um, <laughs> Blurmy, is that helping? Is that demystifying? Is that uh, uh, maybe challenging some cultural and traditional norms? What's your, what are your thoughts? I, th I think 
I think it definitely, of course, it is a step forward yeah. to even come up and do ads like that. But then, what's the point if you're still going to call? Look, uh, I mean, look at blood as blue and green. You know, I mean, I just don't understand that. And that, yeah. for me, well, yeah. because any sort of conversation that it generates is important in breaking down the taboo. Yeah. And the more we talk about it, and the more that menstruation is actually seen on mainstream media, in a commercial, on the internet, on programs like this. It normalizes the subject. It takes that mystery and, and strangeness away from it, and it just makes people see that it, it's normal and it's comfortable to talk about it, sure. and uh, it, it's not something to be ashamed of. While we were researching this show, we found some extraordinary ideas about menstruation. We wanted to share some of them with you during this program. Take a look. something that should be alarming. Uh -huh. um, but the truth is that uh, like cow dung, uh, you find women uh, around the world improvising, finding materials. Uh, we've heard anecdotal evidence of people using, obviously, the traditional rags, but things like found material, like pieces of old mattresses, and even uh, inserting them into the bodies. Hash Brown here says in some Indian cultures, women are not allowed to enter the kitchen during the whole menstrual period. And then let me show you another one. This one is from Ugo Joseph. And he says that in my community, women cook with a special wrapper. A wrapper is that uh, fabric that you will wind around your waist, like a very long skirt. Uh, it's in a lot of African countries, women wear that. And uh, so they're wearing the special wrapper, but no undies. And that way, they stop women in their period from cooking. So uh, a, a lot of the stories that we're hearing is, is to do with products or lack of products. Uh, Sabrina, um, what are you using in your programs with Femme International to help people get over that hurdle about not having products? We really want to focus on reusable products so they don't have that financial burden that menstruation often enforces for women and girls. So we use reusable pads that can be washed um, and then teaching them how to wash them in a, in a safe and hygienic way. Another solution that we've had a lot of success with in East Africa is menstrual cups, which are, um, if, if you Google a menstrual cup, there's tons of great images and videos teaching you all about it. I'll give you a brief explanation. It is made of surgical grade silicone. It's just about this big. Sabrina, um, I'm just showing it right now. I'm, I, I didn't realize that there was this Perfect. A, a, a Wikipedia site called Menstrupedia. Guess what it tells you all about? Menstruation. <laughs> yes, and then I, I, I'm going to suggest, Sabrina, because we only have so much time left on this show, that you go to Menstrupedia, look up Menstrual Cup, and it will tell you what you need to know. I'm on this page right now. It seems only yeah. fair to talk about B girl products. Mm -hmm. uh, Pablo, because Pablo's sitting there like, and we are helping young women around the world too. Let me just show you uh, what the Bill B girl products look like. Pablo, talk us through this very swiftly. What are, what are we seeing here? Good. Well, B-Girl underwear was designed to be completely adaptable to the circumstance of any girl or woman anywhere. So I've actually got some samples here that I can show you. Uh, but we've designed this underwear with a pocket, uh, and the pocket can be filled with an absorbent material, whether it's uh, the liner that we sent. So you'll see the underwear here. There's a pocket and a liner that goes inside the pocket. Uh, so that can be used as a reusable absorbent. But we found many cases where girls are finding these improvised materials. So what we wanted to do is give autonomy and dignity back to women and girls anywhere. Uh, so I'll just show you an example of someone that was using kitchen towels as the absorbent uh, in the underwear. And so what we found is also this type of uh, response back to what we know that women everywhere have been doing, which is finding uh, things in their environment that are going to be absorbent. What we've created is a impermeable pocket from leaks. Leaking is one of the biggest fears around periods and the participation of women. So if you think about what it's like to be a girl in a classroom that might know the answer to a question that nobody else knows, for fear of raising your hand because you don't want to be called up to the board to respond to the question because you might leak, you can see that there's a feedback loop in which the stigma around periods can even create uh, limitations on women and girls that they are imposing on themselves. 
pa Pablo, I love, I love that you're showing these live on air. I, I want to share with you what people are thinking of this. So this is Nora who tweets in, loving the set design on AJ Stream right now. When was the last time you saw maxi pads as stage art? And so I would add to that, when was the last time you saw a gentleman on live television holding up two feminine products um, that are geared to women? I think that is important because of this next tweet. Stefan says, it's great to see men participating knowledgeably about this. As a man, I find it frustrating the stigma still exists. Men, learn. Look forward to seeing you next time. Take care.